Hello, my beautiful friends. I am Laurel Bleeden Maffei with Illuminating Souls, welcoming you to this episode of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, a podcast designed to help you rest, relax, and fall asleep all while deepening in your connection with your beautiful team of angels who love you so. If we're meeting for the first time, I am an angelic practitioner, a spiritual teacher, and an encourager of souls. And I do this through one-on-one angel sessions, soul mentoring, and a variety of classes designed to inspire your spirit. And to learn more about my offerings, I invite you to visit my website at illuminatingsouls.com where you can also sign up for my mailing list and that way you'll be in the know of all that I have coming down the road. But for now, The angels and I are creating this sweet broadcast for you to help you deepen in divine love, to come into a soothing and comforting sweet space where it'll be easier for you to relax. And if your intention is to fall asleep, that will create this lovely space which will hopefully make it easy for you to drift off into a beautiful, sweet sleep. So I'm going to start off by sharing with you that it feels like it has been ages since I have sat in front of this microphone to create an episode for you. It actually hasn't been that long, but I'm used to doing this every few days and I took a few weeks off because I was traveling and then I was recovering from traveling and that's why you had four replays in a row. I'm so glad I have so many episodes there because I do enjoy sharing the replays with you, but I really enjoy getting to create new content for you. So as I shared with you before, this podcast is a mashup of two of my favorite forms of self-care, connecting with the angels and also listening to a sleep podcast. I listen to one every single night and it helps me drift off. And so this is why I am creating this moment for you. So I invite you to get comfortable in whatever way works best for you and to take some nice deep breaths in and out, just allowing the angels to meet you where you are. That feels like that is an important invitation to allow your angels to meet you where you are right now. I think sometimes on the spiritual journey, we think we have to somehow shift our vibration, come into a meditative state, clear our minds, pray. All of those endeavors are wonderful but they are also not required to receive angelic love and support. Your angels can meet you where you are, but it's helpful if you will give them permission, if you will invite them into your space. And so in this moment, we send you blessings for wherever you are. Whatever you are experiencing, whatever is in your heart, to just allow love to meet you in this next breath. 
and in the ones that follow. That your angels are aware of all that is transpiring for you. They know the truth of your heart and they love you. That in this moment there is nothing you need to do or become. That you are precious right now as is. And so just breathe. You know, I don't know about how it works for you, but for me, I have found it to be so helpful to develop the ability to self-reflect about where I am within myself and how I am orienting to life in any given moment because just like the weather changes sometimes it changes throughout the day so do I in terms of how I'm feeling what I'm thinking what is required of me I'll give you an example So I have been traveling and I have had a lovely few weeks. It started off with a road trip. I drove down to Palm Desert to meet my sister and her husband and her three children who I love all of them. They had rented a home in the area and I got a hotel room nearby and it gave us some lovely time together. And the drive was nine hours and I drove on my own there and back. It was a graceful drive, but still a nine hour drive in a day is a lot for me at least. And then I got home and I had one day at home and I taught classes and did sessions And then the next day, my husband and I drove up to Portland, Oregon, as opposed to Portland, Maine, that would be a whole other endeavor, but Portland, Oregon, which was a 10 hour drive because he had a conference to attend there. And again, it was lovely. We met some of the loveliest people there. And then we drove home another 10 hour drive home. So in a period of about 10 days, I drove about 40 hours and I was around people (laughs) and I enjoy people, but I also get overstimulated. And I came back and had a very full week because I was catching up from sort of being off the grid for a week. And then we had a friend visiting from out of town who I thoroughly enjoyed getting to spend time with. And then I will tell you, I have needed time to decompress. So, you know, I sometimes think that we contemplate our well-being based on having to heal from something that's difficult. But I am calibrated in such a way that I also need time to regroup even after the most wonderful experiences that stimulate me, that have me around people so I'm engaging differently, where I'm in different environments, different stimulus. And so yesterday was the first day I started feeling like I was coming back. So this ability to be able to self-reflect and where am I right now? What do I need? How am I feeling? (laughs) Has become a really important part of my self-care. And I knew that if I could just give myself time to be in the quiet, and that doesn't mean meditation. It might mean watching television or listening to an audio book just sort of disengaging from the world, that my 
system will be able to replenish and recharge. I think I've shared this with you before, but perhaps you've never heard this. Um, so maybe it'll be new information to you. I did my DNA testing just like many other people have done. And this was many years ago. And I found a place where you can upload your genetic file and then it reflects to you things about yourself. And as I was going down the list of things, it was reflecting about me, including that I have red hair and blue eyes, which of course I already know. I get to one section and it says, you are a worrier. <laughs> and I thought, well, I am, but how do you know? Like what's in my genetics that causes me to be predisposed to worrying? And what I learned is, this is an incredibly common genetic marker, that for all of us, dopamine goes into the prefrontal cortex. That happens to all of us who are alive. And there is an enzyme that is supposed to burn off the dopamine. In 50% of the population, it works properly. In 25% of the population, it is not as effective and the dopamine is not burned off quickly enough. So it creates a dopamine overload. And this can cause anxiety, overwhelm, panic attacks, and worry. It also makes us deeply empathic. I thought, wow, that makes a lot of sense. And then in the other 25% of the population, it burns off too quickly. And these are the people who are the risk takers, bungee jumpers, <laughs> taking adventures. And the, the, there's an article you can find about this, and it's the worrier versus the warrior and it's the COMT genetic mutation. So knowing this about myself, when I have an expanse of experiences like I have the past few weeks, my system almost gets overloaded. It's not a bad thing, it just is, right? It's like how some people have hay fever, right? I just can get overloaded with stimulus. And I need time to allow my system to rebalance. And it was interesting because I know that I was more anxious than usual over the weekend. Nothing horrible, nothing that I couldn't manage. But I just could feel that my emotional response to life was elevated. And that if I could just wait it out, I would come to center within a few days. I share this with you because I think it's really helpful to normalize understanding how our unique instruments work. My needs are likely different than yours. But especially as we continue awakening to who we are, to what serves us, it's important to learn how does your instrument work? What replenishes you? What brings you energy? What inspires you? And to honor that instead of making ourselves wrong. Right? In a different environment, I could easily be labeled as high maintenance. And I am, <laughs> the truth is. But I take responsibility for my own maintenance. I don't have an expectation that everybody else conforms to my schedule and what I need. 
I dwell in the house, in the vessel that is me. And so I am responsible for my self-care and I honor what I need for my self-care. And so I invite you to gently contemplate what you need for your self-care as well, even if it's different than what those around you need. You are the greatest authority on you. And so with that, I invite you to take a deep breath in. And this is why this invitation to invite the angels to meet you where you are right now is that this will always be available to you. You don't have to do something different. You don't have to become something different than you are right now. You don't have to change the way you pray or how you sit or make space for them. Right now, they are here with you and they are sending you love. So take another deep breath in, if you will, and let that out. And the angels are already here, but I love sharing the ritual with you of inviting them to join us. So beautiful angels on high, I am so grateful for your presence here. And I do invite you to meet us where we are right now. I ask that you bring streams of divine love to each of our beloveds who are with us here. I ask that you help clear from us anything that is not ours, helping to clear away any worries, any fears that do not serve, allowing us to come into sanctuary this beautiful divine light where we are loved, where we are held in our wholeness and our humanness. So dear ones, just take another nice deep breath in, allowing the divine light to meet you where you are. And just breathe and receive and I'm asking the angels to help transmit to you the vibration of divine well-being, helping to calm and soothe your energy field. And I feel so much compassion and understanding flowing through from the angels for you. You are so precious in this world. You are a gift from on high. You are enough. You are more than enough. This world is brighter because you are here. And so if your intention is to drift off to sleep, I invite you to cozy on up and snuggle on in. And your angels will be with you. And while you rest, I'm going to tell you a story. So for this episode, I thought I would share with you about how I wound up going off of sugar back in the 90s. It might not sound like a terribly interesting story, but it, it kind of is, I, I think, it anyways. And it's a sleep podcast, and so my intention is not to share with you a riveting story that will cause you to stay awake, but I'm going to be rambling here with you and speaking to you and soft, sweet tones and 
it'll make it easier for you to drift off. So this is part plus size diaries plus something about my health journey. I'm going to weave in a really adorable story about my husband. I'm going to share with you about my favorite bakery ever. So we're going to talk about food, yummy food. So there's going to be just a little bit of everything for you in this episode. See, originally I was going to talk about my love of bakeries, which I still may do. I had been looking through some old Google books and came across an old trade magazine for bakeries from the 1900s and there were interesting articles and so I was going to read those. And then I sort of fell down my own internal rabbit hole and started thinking of this wonderful sugar-free bakery in Los Angeles that doesn't exist anymore, but we'll get there. And how I went off of sugar at some point in the 90s, which led me to discover this bakery. And if this sounds a bit rambly, um, it's because it is, but it's all going to weave together beautifully by the end of this episode, I promise. So we're going to start off in the mid-90s. I am living in Los Angeles, and that's meaningful because I moved to Westchester County, New York for about 18 months before that. So at this point, I'm back living in Los Angeles. And I'm a sugar fiend. I've been a sugar fiend my whole life. Perhaps you can relate. I love sugar in all of its many forms. And somewhere, somewhere around 95 or 96, I started having and sorry if this is TMI, but this was the catalyst for me, I started having recurring yeast infections, which are miserable, (laughs) miserable. And at the time, the thing was to go to the doctor and they would give you a prescription called Diflucan and you would go on that and it would knock it out of your system. But then what was happening to me was within a month I had another one. So this was recurring and it was miserable. And I remember talking to my doctor, like, what's going on? What can I do? And he or she, I don't remember if I was seeing a male or female doctor at that point, said, that's just the way your body is. It's just your body's imbalance. And to me, that was a horrible answer. Now, to set the stage, it's around 95 or 96. So the internet is just starting to be a thing. So I was on the internet at that point, but it's not like it is now, where Dr. Google is available to you for everything and you can get advice on everything. I remember that my cousin was going through, my cousin Susie, who I've shared with you about before, was going through a similar cycle. So we were both miserable in our own respective ways. So one day I was so uncomfortable and unhappy. And there was this holistic pharmacy in West Hollywood. I believe it was called Capital Drugs. And somehow I'd heard about it or known about it, whether that was through the LA Weekly or Friends, I don't quite remember. But I remember that it was holistic and holistic at that moment sounded like what I needed. (laughs) Clearly, Western medicine was failing me, but maybe there was something else I could do. So I go into this drugstore and I don't know if she was an assistant manager, but she, she was in some level of authority there and I must have really looked unhappy. I may have been crying. And I was sharing with her, I'm having these recurring yeast infections and I don't know what to do. And I am so unhappy. And she could not have been lovelier 
about it. And she took me over to the side and she calmed me down and she started getting so excited because she knew how to help me. And as someone who has lived my way into serving as a healer of sorts, I have to say I now understand her glee because when we know we can help someone, that is the best feeling ever. So it turned into perhaps a two hour consult. So she started off by taking out this big book that is still in publication called Optimal Wellness by Ralph Golan. He is, I believe he's a functional medicine practitioner or holistic, but he's an MD. His last name is G-O-L-A-N. The book is called Optimal Wellness. The edition that I have was published in 1995, so that's why I say this was probably around 95 or 96 that this all happened to me. And it's a fascinating book. It's about the size of an old phone book. I mean, it's substantial. And there is a series of quizzes you can take in the book that will help you discern, are you suffering from candida overgrowth, which is yeast? Do you have adrenal fatigue, Um, sluggish liver or whatever? (laughs) I don't remember what they all were. And once you sort of discern where your imbalance is, he shares with you homeopathic remedies, holistic remedies, you know, different things you can do. So this woman was so excited. She says, all, all your answers are in here and I'm going to help you. And so we started talking and, and this is my memory of what we came to. She was doing muscle resistance testing on me. So that's kinesiology. And I knew about it because of experiences that I had back in the late 80s when I had gone to Pepperdine University for my MBA, which I did not get. But one of the classes I took was metaphysical in nature and the teacher taught us about muscle resistance testing. So I believed in it. I was like, yes, let's do muscle resistance testing. So she put me on this program First of all, I had to go off sugar. She says, you cannot eat sugar anymore. It is feeding the yeast. And I was so miserable. I was like, I'll do anything. So she had me move into a healthier way of eating that involved no sugar. She put me on a series of supplements. So for two weeks, I would be on echinacea and golden seal. I took vitamin C. And then after two weeks, I would go over to, is it astragalus or astragalus? I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing these herbs, but both of them boost the immune system. But I'd go on one for two weeks and the other for two weeks and then go back. The Pau de Arco tea, she would have me drink every day. This was all to boost my immune system. And acidophilus. So nowadays, we know so much about the microbiome and everything has, right, lack, the, you know, the good bacteria, lactobacillus, whatever they call it. I knew it as acidophilus. And she said the goal was to kill the yeast and build up my good bacteria again and bring me back into balance. And I hope it goes without saying that I am not giving you medical advice here. This is a recounting of something that happened to me back in 1995 or 96 and what the practitioner at the time told me. And we did this muscle resistant testing so she knew how many tablets I should take and how long I should be on them. And it was a revelation to me. It was one of my first experiences of holistic medicine. And I remember leaving the store with probably a hundred dollars worth of supplements. I didn't care. And the book. I was like, give me everything. I need everything now. 
And I called my cousin and I said, okay, <laughs> we need to go off sugar. We can't eat sugar anymore. And we can't eat anything that has yeast in it right now. Right? So no beer, not that we drank a lot of beer, but at the time I was still consuming alcohol. So, so, you know, stay off fermented things and bread and, and, and this is what we're going to do to get better. And so we both went off sugar at the same time. And I don't even remember at what point I started feeling better, but I did. And the yeast infections went away and I started feeling better. And so did my cousin. So we both became evangelists for not eating sugar. <laughs> and I was off sugar for about 12 years. And so I didn't eat stuff that had refined sugar in it. I mean, okay, let me rephrase that. If refined sugar was somewhere on the ingredients list, but it was far down the list, I would eat it. You know, salad dressing, things like that have sugar in it. Barbecue sauce. I wasn't worried about that kind of sugar. But I had had an addiction to foods that celebrated sugar, aka candy and pastries and cake and ice cream, like anything that would fit into the dessert category, I was addicted to. So going off of sugar meant that that whole subset of foods was no longer available to me. It didn't exist. I could still eat fruit. Fruit didn't bother me at all. I could eat I mean, I could still eat a lot and it's not that I lost a ton of weight or anything that isn't that part, that isn't that kind of story. But for 12 years, I didn't eat sugar. So if someone brought a birthday cake into the office, everyone knew I didn't eat it. You know, if, um, for Halloween, didn't matter what kind of candy I got, I wasn't going to eat it. And it's so interesting. There's a, a great book by... Dr. David Kessler called The End of Overeating. And I don't know that I even read the book all the way through, but there was a series of videos that used to be available on YouTube. I haven't been able to find them since. So his background is that he ran the FDA under Clinton and he always had struggled with his weight. And so he did a deep study into like the neurology, you know, brain chemistry of overeating. And one of the things he said is, if there is a food that an individual can no longer eat, like if all of a sudden you find out that you have an allergy to peanuts, it's like the brain flips that switch off so that that food no longer exists for you. And what I found to be so interesting about those 12 years was it wasn't as if I was on a diet. When I would diet and would restrict myself from food, I would still think about it all the time. I could tell you what I have not eaten, I can tell you what I missed out on. There's a lot of FOMO, fear of missing out. So my brain would still actively be craving those foods. But when I was off sugar for those 12 years, that did not exist for me. It's like I don't drink alcohol anymore. And it's not because I, I was... Um, I had a problem with addiction. I just chose to stop because I didn't like how it feels in my body. And I, you could show me every single ad for alcohol and walk me past every bar and margarita stand. It wouldn't matter. It doesn't exist for me. And that's how it felt about sugar. 
I could walk past C's Candy or a bakery and it didn't bother me. It didn't exist. I, I, I was not able to eat those foods. So that part of my brain seemingly switched off. So that's where this bakery story comes in. So, you know, L.A., well, maybe you don't, but Los Angeles is all about healthy food, healthy eating, healthy everything. And this bakery opened called Manny's, M-A-N-I apostrophe S, Manny's Bakery on Fairfax. And their claim to fame was they did not use refined sugar. They used fruit juice concentrate. There was a company called Wax Orchards that has sadly closed that created this fruit juice concentrate. And basically that would take the different fruit juices, whether that was apple or pear, whatever it was, and it gets distilled down into a syrup form and that would be used to sweeten baked goods. Now, from a calorie perspective, it doesn't mean that these are dietetic foods, but it was marketed as a healthier alternative for people who didn't want to eat sugar. And I was all in. I was like, wait a second. This was back when we still thought things like agave and fruit juice didn't do the same thing to blood sugar as refined sugar. And, you know, it was the 90s. We were still learning about all of these things. So I, of course, found my way to Manny's Bakery. And they have every, they had, I'm, st- I'm in my mind, I'm there. <laughs> they had everything cakes, cookies, pastries, everything you could think of. And everything to me was delicious because my palate had adjusted to foods that were less sweet. My sugar eating friends did not think their things were as good, (laughs) but I thought they were delicious. I even have one of their old menus that I found online and printed out. So let me describe a few of their treats to you. So they had muffins. I love a good muffin. I don't get to eat them anymore because of the sugar, but also even if they don't have sugar, they are high in in calories. So I'm mindful about those things. But I will say when I was in Palm Desert, There is a coffee house, the IW Coffee House. They have sugar-free muffins, brand blueberry sugar-free muffins that are delicious. So I did have a few muffins when I was in Palm Desert. I even brought a few home to put in the freezer for another day. But it's not a food I can eat every day if I want to try and balance my food life. But let's get back to Manny's. And just so you know, man, it, his, the, the chef's name is Manny Niall, N-I-A-L-L. And he does have a cookbook that has many of these recipes in it. And even though Wax Orchards does not exist anymore, For the fruit juice concentrate, you can make your own or substitute agave or maple syrup or honey if you want, or dates, if you want to try to make something without refined sugar. So there's a banana oat muffin with organic whole wheat flour sweetened with fruit juice reduction, a chocolate chip muffin. I know I loved that. It had barley malt sweetened chocolate, which was a thing then. So again, not refined sugar. So my system handled it differently. 
and it also had organic wheat flour sweetened with fruit juice reduction. A zucchini yam muffin. Oh my God, that sounds so good. Organic whole wheat flour, shredded yams and zucchini and chopped walnuts and fruit juice reduction. They also had coffee cake. They had scones. They had a chocolate croissant, again with barley malt sweetened chocolate and sweetened with fruit juice reduction. They had pies. They also had delicious cookies, right? Every kind of cookie. I remember loving their biscotti. So orange chocolate biscotti, sliced almonds, orange zest, organic wheat flour, Oh, this one had evaporated cane sugar. Okay, I may have had that one, but not very often because I didn't do as well on evaporated cane sugar as I did on fruit juice reduction. Oh, they had eclairs that Wes and I loved, and I'm going to bring the Wes story into this in just a minute. So chocolate-covered eclair, I can still taste them. They were so good. Organic whole wheat pastry shell, filled with custard dipped in barley malt sweetened chocolate and topped with pistachios sweetened with fruit juice reduction. But the joy to me, well, it all was a joy, but were their cakes. They had wonderful cakes with great frosting. They had the chocolate raspberry fortress, which is a chocolate cake layered with a chocolate speckled whipped cream, raspberries, and contained by a wall of solid barley malt sweetened chocolate, sweetened with fruit juice reduction. And they also had a phenomenal carrot raisin cake, spiced carrot cake with raisins, frosted with a vegan cream cheese, and dusted with toasted almond meal, sweetened with fruit juice reduction. So here is where my adorable West story comes in. (laughs) This is one of our classic stories. So when Wes and I met, he was spending a lot of time with me in Los Angeles and he wasn't eating sugar either because I think he just was being, he wasn't a big sugar eater to start with. He was being very supportive of me though, as he always is. And I introduce him to Manny's, which he promptly also falls in love with. So it wasn't unusual for us to go to Manny's and buy a whole bunch of things and then go home and feast over a couple of days. So this one time we go there and the thing you should know about that neighborhood in Los Angeles is parking is impossible. It was on Fairfax and it was really hard to find a meter, especially on the weekend. And when we had gone there, I think it must have been the afternoon and there was zero parking. I must have circled the few blocks several times and we couldn't find anywhere to park. So I'm kind of annoyed. I'm, I'm doing the driving at this point. And so I decide to just park in the red zone. And I said to Wes, so you go in and get our order. You go in and pick. This is in the day before we had DoorDash and Instacart and all of those things. So you go pick what, you know what we want. You go in and get it and I'll stay here in the car. I'll move if they tell me to. So I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm seeing the line move and other people are coming out and I'm waiting some more, like 20 minutes. I'm waiting. I don't know that it was 20 minutes, but it felt that long and I'm getting heated. I'm like, what is, what is he doing in there? What is taking so long? Everybody else is going in and coming out. So I'm getting aggravated. And finally, Wes comes out to the car. He's practically dancing his way out to the car. He is so happy. And he gets into the car and I'm, I'm like, what took you so long? And he goes, I have the best thing ever. I did the best thing ever. 
And I'm annoyed. I'm like, what could have possibly taken this long? And he goes into the bag and he picks up two containers that contain only frosting. And he goes, I talked to the chef and I asked if I could just buy the frosting because the frosting was the part that we loved the most of any cake we would get. We would, we would like split the frosting because the frosting was the best part. And he, he, he picks up two containers. One has the chocolate frosting and the other has the vegan cream cheese frosting. And he goes, I asked if I could talk to the chef and I said, could I just buy the frosting? It's our favorite part and I'll pay whatever you need me to pay. And he said the chef laughed and thought about it and said, sure. And so he gave us, bought, we, we purchased them. He wested two giant containers of frosting. <laughs> so Wes comes into the car, so proud of himself, so happy because he knows how much I love the frosting. You know, the, some people are not frosting people. I think the frosting is often the best part of the cake. I love the frosting of life in general. And so my agitation quickly dwindles because this beautiful man who I am going to marry was creative enough to be able to secure for us the frosting. (laughs) Like my own personal culinary MacGyver got us a hoard of frosting. It was a beautiful thing. And so (laughs) that's our frosting story. That Wes is the kind of guy who knows how to go and get frosting. Like he knew that was the best part. And, you know, it's interesting. Now, later, years later, places do just sell the frosting, right? There's different cupcake bakeries you can go to and just order frosting shots. But back then, it wasn't really a thing. So, so that's how I went off of sugar. That's my love of Manny's Bakery. That's my adorable story about my beautiful husband, who is so wonderful to me in so many ways, including that day that he got us the frosting. And... I was off of sugar until 2008, and 2008 was not a good year. It it, it was a hard year for me. I had just moved to Vallejo, and I was not happy to be here. I had had a lap band, which is a form of bariatric surgery, that needed to be removed, and so I was really off kilter food-wise and gaining weight rapidly. And I started eating sugar again. And there was a single gateway incident that set me off. And it had to do with a limited edition (laughs) M&M. So these days, there are a lot of limited edition M&Ms. Back then, they had never done it before. At least, I didn't think they had. And there was a limited edition M&M that sounded delicious to me. And I was at Grocery Outlet, which is kind of like the dollar store for groceries. And they had them reduced at an incredibly low price. And so I was like, well, I can't pass this up. It's a limited edition. I'm never going to have it again. And they're really cheap. And if you're a foodie, you will know this next sentence. And Wes will enjoy them. Like, how often do we justify the foods we buy because we think somebody else will, quote, enjoy them and we'll just have a little bit? And so they were amazing. And unfortunately... It flipped that switch back on in my brain that said, now I can eat sugar again. 
And it wasn't as if I started gorging sugar right away. It's a slippery slope. But I did. I started eating sugar again. And so my love of all things dessert came back on with a vengeance. And so that was really, really hard. And I continued eating sugar for many, many years after after that. And I will say I went back off of sugar. I'm still off of it. On August 1st, 2019. So for almost 11 years after that, I was eating sugar. And that meant I got to have you know, Danish and ice cream, like all the foods that I loved, but I also gained a tremendous amount of weight. And the significance of August 1st, 2019, is that's when I committed to the bariatric program that I was in that would ultimately allow me to have another bariatric surgery, which I had on July 19th, 2020. So I went off of sugar. I just said, I, ha- I can't eat it anymore. It can't exist for me because I either can have no sugar or I can have all the sugar. There is no moderation for me. And that is something I've had to learn about myself. You know, there's certain foods I can eat in moderation and it's no problem. Like if, if somebody has French fries, I can eat a few French fries and it doesn't mean that I get to eat all the French fries every day. It doesn't bother me. But I cannot eat sugar. I do not trust myself with sugar because I can either have no sugar or I can have all of it. And all of it means that like this volcano of desire erupts in me that I cannot manage. So in some ways, I'm grateful that there is not a Manny's Bakery in existence anymore that I can go to every day because I would. I am grateful that I have learned how to eat in a way that does not put me into an addictive response. I still love my treats. I love food. I think about it all the time. But going off of sugar has been key for me because of that part in my brain that right now is quiet. It's quiet. I just we're we're going to be celebrating um, two of Wes's daughter's birthdays this weekend. And I went to what used to be one of our favorite bakeries in the area that they have delicious cake and you can buy cake by the slice. And when I was still on sugar, Wes and I loved to go there and get slices of cake. And I went there to buy a cake for their birthday because it's their birthday and they should have a really delicious cake. And I can tell you right now, I absolutely know I will not be having any of it. Not from this place of denial or watching other people eat cake and being really sad that I can't have it and having that trigger something for me. It doesn't exist for me. It doesn't exist. I will not have any. What I will be having is some of the very amazing, delicious cantaloupe that is in season right now, which if you're a sugar person, you might think that is a terrible substitute, but go and find yourself the sugar kiss melon, the cantaloupe. They taste like sugar. And that's what I'm going to be having when they have their cake. And I'm going to be absolutely delighted with my choice. So that's a little bit of my journey with sugar. I know, I know the deepest level of my being 
if I ever go back onto refined sugar, I will be in deep trouble. So I don't eat it. I will have things that are sweetened with coconut sugar, agave, dates. I don't eat a lot of dessert-like foods, though. I really try to focus on things that have high nutritional value because I have a limited amount of real estate in my stomach these days and I can get into trouble. It's a slippery slope for me. But I am so grateful for Manny's Bakery when it existed. It brought me a lot of delight. It brought me a wonderful memory with Wes, for sure. We still giggle over that. I do have the cookbook, so I can make any of those recipes, even though Wax Orchards doesn't exist anymore. I can substitute agave or honey or something. Again, I know in terms of dietary sugars and calories, they're similar. They just land differently for me and my body. So here's to our journeys. Here's to delightful and delicious food. Here's to food that has high nutritional content that supports our well-being. Here's to life. Here's to goodness. Here's to joy. Here's to our ever-evolving experience of our physical bodies and our awarenesses and how to take good care of ourselves. A lot, I guess the theme for today is self-care in some ways, positive, wonderful, inspired self-care because we are all worthy of it. So my beautiful beloved friend, I send you love. I wish you the sweetest of dreams and I am grateful for our time together. So thank you so much. You are very precious to me and we'll talk again soon.